Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to be conducting some temperature tests and implementing a range of cooling solutions on a Raspberry Pi 4. Specifically, I'm going to start out with the Pi 4 in its official case, see how hot it gets running in here, and then after that I'm going to be adding a small heatsink and then I'll put the board into a third-party case with a larger heatsink, and then after that I'll be setting up my own far more radical active cooling solution. Right, here we have the Raspberry Pi 4B sitting in its official case, no heatsink fitted, so this is exactly how you get the Pi out of the box. So I'll put the top on the case so we've got the Pi exactly as it's intended to run in the official case, and we'll move to the Raspbian desktop, and uh, here we are where I've got a script we're going to be using to take temperature measurements throughout the, uh, the video. And what this basically does is it tells us it's a bash script at the top, it's going to clear the terminal, it's going to run a loop, so I've got a comment saying we're having a loop, here's the loop for f in the range 1 to 7, it'll do this 7 times, and then inside do there it is going to take a temperature measurement, and then it's going to run this sysbench command, which is going to factor prime numbers up to a value of 25,000. So it's going to stress out the CPU factoring prime numbers. And that should take just under 90 seconds on a Pi, unless the Pi throttles and slows itself down, which it will in part to these earlier tests. But basically this test should take about 10 minutes to run through, consistently reporting temperature measurements, and the final temperature measurement on the end. You can also see on the screen here at the top we've got the CPU utilization meter, currently very low, not a lot is happening, the Pi is idling along. And we've also got a temperature measurement here as well, and you'll see the Pi is idling at about 73-74 degrees inside this case, that really is very high. The ambient here today is about 25 degrees, so it's against that contact, but even so, that's very high. So with some nervousness, I'm going to run this a first test. So here is our terminal, and I'll start it off. And of course I'll now speed on through out of real time. And here we are about halfway through. I don't normally pause halfway through one of these tests, but it's worth noting, as I'm sure you've seen, the Pi is clearly throttling. It's uh, showing red there in the temperature gauge at the top. It's got a little thermometer up on the screen. This is not a temperature a Pi should be running at. I will let this finish, but this is not a test I intend running more than once. And there we are, it's finished. And a test that should have taken about 10 minutes took more like a 35 to 40 minutes. Which means, of course, the different tests in this video will actually take different periods of time, which isn't ideal. But the Pi will be performing the same amount of computation in each test. And I hope we don't throttle like this in the future tests with cooling solutions. As you can see, the Pi settled at uh, just about 89 degrees, just got up to 90 at the end. And if I open up the box, which is very hot, inside here it's very, very hot indeed. But at least we've got a baseline, so let's now implement some cooling solutions. So, here I am back again, and as you can see I've now taken the Pi out of the case, and I've fitted it with a very typical Raspberry Pi heatsink. This heatsink, I think, is 14 by 14 by 7 millimetres and attached with a thermal pad to the SOC on the Pi. And I should say it's now the next day. The Pi has spent overnight in therapy, gearing up, getting itself ready for this test, and the ambient is now 24, one degree less than it was yesterday. Anyway, let's go back to the uh, desktop. Here we are and run the script again. And straight away we can see the Pi is running a lot cooler, I let it idle for a few minutes before I started the test, and clearly it's uh, idling a lot lower than it was previously in the case without the heatsink. So let's speed on through for the whole test. And there we are, it's finished, and clearly a much cooler result than we had uh, with the Pi in the case. It was obviously at its lower throttling threshold throughout a lot of this test, lots of orange up here but no uh, red and it throttles at about 81, 82, which is what we saw here. So that is settled at about 82 degrees C, and the test ran in about 11 minutes rather than 41 minutes in the previous test, so it ran in the sort of time we would expect. So clearly this is a good result, we've improved things for the Pi, but let's see if we can now run it even cooler.
Right, to lower the temperature even more, I'm going to move to a larger heatsink. And specifically, I'm going to use this heatsink from Pimeroni, which is a 40 by 30 by a 5 millimeter heatsink. It's got a heat pad on the back, and it'll just about fit on the Pi. It just goes in there. It's designed by Pimeroni for a Pi 4. It costs a £2.40 in the UK, although it keeps going out of stock. Don't have a US price uh, yet. And it'd be nice to have this mounted on the Pi in a case which would accommodate it. And in case you're thinking, why didn't I try the Pi with this heatsink in the uh, official case? I don't see any point putting a Pi with a heatsink inside a completely enclosed case. So we need a case for the Pi which will accommodate this heatsink, but actually be nice and open, have good ventilation. And the case I'm going to use is this one here. This is a, a Pi Moroni Pi Bow case. These come in various colors. This is the Ninja colors. So let's get inside. This is a straighter rip open, I think. There we are. Oh yes, I'm destroying it. There we are. Hopefully I can get inside. I thought this would be easy. No, no. Oh, there we are. Look, it is inside. Found it. And on inside here, we have all the pipe pieces to make our, uh, made a right mess of that, didn't I? Our Pi Bow case. So these bits all fit together to form a case for the Pi. Uh, so I'm going to put all that together with the larger heatsink. And by the magic of filmmaking, here we are. It's all gone together. You can see it uh, fits in between these pieces of a laser cut perspex. Looks uh, very nice. I was going to tell you this is a fantastic case. I've used these Pi Bow cases before, but I've had a few issues with this one. I think the engineering tolerances are pushing things a bit too much to accommodate the Pi 4 because uh, here at the top, this piece actually snapped just there. And in fact, a piece has snapped off entirely in there. And in fact, if I show you the edge, uh, you might be able to see here, but this edge piece here, uh, where it is now can entirely separated, uh, inevitably comes up here because the uh, HDMI connectors, the micro HDMI are bigger than the USB 3. So that piece, I can never quite see that would fit in place and not to stamp off the edge there. Anyway, it will work. And as you can see, the heat sink is accommodated very nicely, very tight fit, but the heat sink is there and clearly well ventilated. So uh, let's get this thing connected up and then we'll move back to a desktop and run our test script for a third time. And there we are, it's finished. And again, the test ran in just over 11 minutes. And in the first half of the test, we had no uh, throttling whatsoever, but it then got up to pretty much the same temperatures in the second half. We just put this onto our table of all different results. You can see that really we haven't achieved a great deal by the end of the test. Well, I suppose it's better than the, the first test when it hit 90, but uh, I'm now strongly suspecting that we only really start to properly cool the Raspberry Pi 4B when we apply active cooling. Right, as you can see, I've now stripped down the Pi and I'm going to build an active cooling solution based on a rig that I first constructed in my Raspberry Pi 3B Plus Extreme cooling video and which I refined with 3D printed parts in the video called Online 3D Printing. This rig uses a Noctua NF-A4X20 40 by 20 millimeter fan to provide some serious airflow. And I'd note that this fan comes in both five volt and 12 volt versions. And you'll need the five volt version to use on a Raspberry Pi. And I will of course include links to everything I use here in the video description. Now, my plan had been to reuse these parts from my previous Raspberry Pi 3B Plus cooling rig uh, with the uh, Raspberry Pi 4B. But uh, unfortunately, this isn't going to work as well as the Pi will go on there. This part won't fit because of course they've changed the position of the Ethernet and the USB ports. They've flipped them over on, on the Pi 4B. So what I've done, I'm sure you'd guess, is to uh, get the parts reprinted. I've redesigned this, this top part. I didn't have to reprint the bottom part, but I did. I've not added the uh, sticky feet I've got on this one yet, but I will do that a bit later on. And this should now fit together just fine. That will go in there like that. And the uh, Noctua fan will mount on top and power via a GPIO. But of course, that's only half of the picture. I'm still going to need a heatsink. And I could use the Pi Moroni one that we used in the, the last uh, setup. 
But uh, this heat sink is a little bit big that way. It's a very, very tight fit between the camera and display port. And also, I know it's very difficult for people to get hold of this. So I thought, what can I do in this rig to get a larger heat sink for the Pi, something bigger than the, the small heat sink I've been using in, in the previous test, uh, which people can get hold of very easily. And the thing I've come up with is one of these. This is actually an M.2 drive heatsink. This is normally used on a, a drive like that to a cool an M.2 SSD. And you can buy these online in all kinds of places, not these Amazon have got lots and lots of versions. They normally come with a, a little uh, strip like this, a bit of a tape you can attach them to whatever you're, you're going to cool. And uh, this is actually a 70 by 22 by a five millimeters. They come in different heights, make sure you get the highest you can get. Well not more than about 10 millimeters, but I haven't found any more than about five or six high. So what I'm going to do is to take this heat sink and to attack it with a hacksaw, and I'll end up with uh, three small heat sinks like these. And uh, this is a, come out slightly as an angle at the end, but it's about uh, 22 by 28 millimeters. This is going to go onto the system on a chip, on a pie. I've uh, filed all these down, got them nice and smooth. Make sure you clean them off thoroughly after doing that. You don't want any sort of metal filings to get onto your pie. Anyway, this will go on the system on the chip, and these will go on the Ethernet controller and the USB controller on the Pi. And if we look back to the board, just so you're clear what I'm talking about, this is the system on the chip, which will take the large heatsink, but this is the USB controller, and this is the Ethernet controller. And the USB controller in particular gets very warm on a Raspberry Pi 4. So much so that the Raspberry Pi Foundation have now released a firmware fix, a, a software update, to make the USB controller use a little bit less power and hence to run a bit cooler. And I did apply that update before I started doing the tests in this video. Anyway, let's now get the heat sinks fitted. And there they are. May not be the neatest heat sinks in the world, but they'll hopefully do the job on there. And now if we take some appropriate nuts and bolts and also my uh, sticky feet, we can put everything together to hopefully end up with a very effective Raspberry Pi 4 cooling solution. And I think it looks rather good, doesn't it? I've got the sticky feet on the base. I like to have those there. The, the base is nice and wide here because uh, the Raspberry Pi, once you've got all the wires connected, I find can be a bit unstable. So it's good to have a, a wider base there. And um, you can hopefully see there I've got a good amount of clearance between the top of this, the fan, and the base, partially to line things up with the top of the Pi, but it means I could also try bigger heat sinks in here if I wanted, and also the airflow from the fans will hopefully go out and uh, cool the whole top of the board, get all three heat sinks, everything else there. And uh, just in case you're wondering on the wiring, the wiring for the fan goes to uh, pin four, which is a five volt rail, and pin six, which is a ground rail. And just in case you're also wondering, you could put this setup together just using the top part here to get a smaller setup. Obviously nothing protecting the base of the board, but that would work as well. So now I think it is time to take this uh, full solution and to get it all uh, wired up. And by the magic of filmmaking, here we are. It's all uh, completed. It's all uh, raring to go. So let's now uh, turn on the power and hopefully the fan is going to spring into action. You might be able to hear a slight noise of the fan there. Not a massively noisy fan, but certainly we've got some fan noise. And so I'll now let this run for a few minutes just to establish an idle base, and then we'll move back to the desktop and run our test script for a final time. And there we are. It's finished, and as I'm sure you'll agree, a very good set of results. That run was 10 minutes, which is the length this test should take to uh, run through. And as you can see, the Pi is stabilized at about 55 degrees C with this uh, new active cooling solution. And uh, let's just put that onto the table, compare with the other results. I don't think we need much uh, comparison. You can clearly see that using the Noctua fan for active cooling has worked very well indeed. I think I've certainly established the rig, the cooling solution that I'll be using with a Raspberry Pi 4 in the immediate future. Over the past few years on this channel, I've made several videos featuring cooling solutions for a Raspberry Pi 3B and 3B Plus. And some people in the comments have said, Chris, did you really need to have those solutions? Do you have to cool a Raspberry Pi 3B and 3B Plus? And the answer is, Possibly not. This said, now we've got to the Raspberry Pi 4, some sort of cooling solution, in my view, is absolutely essential. 
at the very least, a Raspberry Pi 4 should have a heatsink fitted, and if you're using it for intensive computing tasks, it really needs an active cooling solution like I've shown in this video. But now that's it for this video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.